Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager, due diligence, or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. You're listening to Top Traders Unplugged. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I know how valuable your time is, so I appreciate you spending some of it here with me. On today's show, I'm talking to Scott Billington of Covenant Capital Management. Covenant is, to say the least, very different to most investment managers out there due to the way they approach strategy design, investment horizon, and trading activity. So I'm sure you will learn a few new things that are thought-provoking and perhaps will even lead you to reassess the way trading success is considered today. Now, for those of you who are new to the show, I just want to let you know that you can find all of the show notes, including a full transcript of today's episode, on the toptradersonplug.com website. Now, let's get started with part one of my conversation. I hope you will enjoy it. Scott, thank you so much for being with us today. It's uh, great to have you on the podcast today. Neil, thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat with you a little bit about Covenant Capital. Fantastic. Now, you quote Leonardo da Vinci in your marketing material with the words, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And this is about 500 years ago he said that. Now, one could say that if this is more than just words to you, you should be able to explain your strategy on the back of a napkin. And as far as I know, that's exactly what you did back in 2003 when you sat down with Dan Collins of Futures Magazine. So it would seem that Leonardo da Vinci's words are quite important to you. So naturally, I'm excited to be able to dive into this topic with you today because too many people believe that more advanced algorithms developed by an army of PhDs must be better than a very simple approach. So I'd love to discuss this from a conceptual point of view and of course specifically in relation to what you do at Covenant. But before we go into all of those details and where you are today, I really would like for you to take us all the way back to the beginning and telling us your story of what led you to take this path and and feel free to go back as, as far as you want. And so it's really important for us to sort of see what led you to uh, where you are today. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. Well, in the mid-90s, I worked for a regional investment bank out of Nashville, Tennessee. And I worked in the brokerage and trading. And we did some commercial hedging. We did a lot of of pre- try attempting to predict where the market would go for our commercial clients and some advisory in that. And we were paid on commission. And what I quickly, or maybe not so quickly, but what I ended <laughs> up coming to the realizing was that, that I needed to be able to make, number one, I didn't like sales very well. And I found an inherent conflict in the, in the, you know, transaction business. And I also figured that if I couldn't trade markets profitably, then I probably needed a different industry. Right. That at the end of the day, that was the the final, you know, that was the reason for doing this and, and everything else was superfluous. Sure. So at the time, I took the Barclays top 20 CTAs over the past 10 years. And I think 15 of the 20 described themselves as long-term trend following. Right. 
And so I was 27, 26 at the time. And so I figured, well, there may be other ways that, that one can make money in the markets, but this seems to be the first place that I ought to look. Okay. So I started putting together basically a trading model. And the, in my opinion, there were kind of three big picture decisions somebody had to make when, it, when, it, when you talked about what kind of trader you were going to be. And the first was, was discretionary or systematic and mechanical. Sure. And so I would define discretionary as I bring in different inputs, whatever those inputs might be. I weigh them in a non-standard fashion, meaning that I don't weigh them necessarily the same way every time. I might bring in the same inputs. I might look at different ratios, but sometimes input A overwhelms input B, and sometimes input B might overwhelm input A, regardless of that might be. And then I would make the trade decisions in that fashion. Sure. Systematic, I define as as I do the exact same thing every time. Right. I might argue that if you have any discretion, then you're discretionary. Sure. So that even if I have a mechanical model, but I decide seven times a year to override it, I suspect those seven times a year are going to be seven of the more volatile and the, you know, the the larger outcome periods and and in essence, you have a discretionary model, which is fine, but, but that you're a discretionary trader. Sure. And the reason that I and we have gone with systematic is, is threefold. The first is that we wanted something that the efficacy of which could be at least estimated through historical modeling and backtesting and the like. Yeah. And so if I'm a discretionary trader, one of the difficulties we found was how do I know that my theory is accurate? Sure. I think that XYZ, whatever XYZ is, and it might make perfect sense, but what I have there is a is a good hypothesis that will be interesting to test, but I really have no method of testing it. Sure. And and therefore no no way to to prove that it, at least my idea had worked in the past. Uh, the second reason that we went with a more systematic uh, model is, is that we felt like it would be much easier to apply to a wide variety of markets. Sure. If I were going to be, uh, you know, and that also ties into the inputs we might use, but if I were going to be discretionary and I were using, you know, attempting to trade the yen and cotton, it would perhaps be very difficult to be an expert in both of those two markets. Sure. Now, you could be discretionary and not necessarily have fundamental or, you know, inputs, but that, that'll be a second part of this answer. Right. And the primary reason that we wanted to be systematic is, is that we felt like we wanted the emotions taken, taken out of the trading process. Yeah. That we wanted something that was repeatable. So that I could say the same decisions that I made in June of 2004, I'm going to make in December of 2018. Sure. It's the same process. It, it's, a, it's a much more repeatable process than, you know, my, you know, my making, weighing all these different factors. Yeah. And the other thing is, is that, and is that we think that it's, I don't know about impossible, but extraordinarily difficult to separate your decision-making process from your own emotional state at a given time. Yeah. I think it's probably a bit fanciful to say that I would make the exact same decisions on the day that I, my wife left me as the day that my son won an Olympic gold medal. <laughs> sure. Uh, much, and, and, you know, not only things, that, but also within trade. Yeah. If I've just had four straight up 15% months, I, I think it's extremely difficult to bring the same analysis that if I just lost, if I'm in the middle of a 30% drawdown. Yeah, that's true. And what, and what we basically said was that my wife has just walked out on me has no should not have any effect on the trades that I take. Sure. So the second thing we looked at was, was okay, what kind of time frame are we going to trade? 
You know, if you look at time frame as a spectrum, am I going to be shorter term or longer term? And and is there some logical reason to to make that selection? Mm. And we've elected to be longer term for one, and it's a it's a it's a it's not a very sexy reason, but it, it's in our minds extremely important. Is is that the is it that random trading's expected outcome in a frictionless or costless world would be to break even? And so, if I'm trading randomly, my expected loss is my costs, mm-hmm. my commissions that I pay, and more importantly, the bid ask spreads that I pay. Sure. And then that's also going to encompass any kind of gaps or you know slippage generally. slippage in a fast market. But again, that's just a wider, in essence, a wider bid ask spread. And those costs come into play every single time I trade. Mm. But they're fixed. So if I hold a trade for eight minutes, the bid ask spread is just as wide as if I held it for eight months. Mm. I might get a little break on commission for my brokerage, but at the end of the day, the, the holding period of my costs is in, it has no impact on my costs. My costs are going to be fixed regardless of my holding period. Mm. And so if you look at it from a from that perspective, and you say, okay, my the amount and, and what we'll call it, what we call a trading edge is is a, is a non-random entry and exit decision. It means I have some non-random method of deciding when I'm going to buy and when I'm going to sell. And the amount above randomness that my method needs to have to break even is my costs. Sure. The costs are in a, in a casino terms, the cost of the house edge. Right. That's how, how positive I need the deck to be or, or that's the amount that I need to be able to forecast future price moves um, to break even. Mm. And so we would consider forecasting future price moves to be extraordinarily difficult. Therefore, we want that hurdle to be as little as possible. Yeah. Makes sense. Does that makes sense, Neil? Yeah. you see where we are with that? Definitely. Now – there is a other side of that coin. A shorter term method is going to have more instances in a given time period, and therefore a smaller net profit, meaning after cost profit, can can be profitable sure. or can have a can have a good method. So I need a larger gross edge because I'm going to give up so much more of my edge in the costs, but a smaller net edge can be profitable in a shorter term. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So with that, the lower hurdle to clear with the lower cost um, parameters to us was an overwhelming argument for for having a longer term method. And this was something that you were doing sort of research while working or how how did that? I'm kind of interested in in taking you back to to the, 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 the very beginning of it and sort of you know, obviously, how what you decided to do, but also the phase of when you decided to uh, all of this. So this was a couple years before we started Covenant Capital, and I was interested in trying to develop a winning trading method, and so I started doing some back testing. And at the time, you know, this was mid '90s. I was doing all this back testing by hand. Wow. So, well, that's a good way not to be curve fitting. <laughs> and, and, and I say that in jest, but, but that's actually accurate. Sure. It eliminates your ability to, to curve fit or try to fine tune everything to fit past market behavior. Sure, absolutely. And I remember this, is that we were brokers and, and we had a client. And I remember when I would get the P&L for the clients at the end of the year. And I looked at this client and I said, oh, wow, they lost $109,000 last year. Mm. They must not have been very good traders. <laughs> but then I looked over and I noticed, wait a second, they paid us $174,000 in commission. Yeah. These guys were great traders. Yeah. They just had bad brokers. Sure. And that doesn't even include the bid-ass spread that they paid. Yeah, sure. True. So if you think about it, the points at which they decided to get in and out of the market were frankly excellent. Mm. They just traded way too much. Yeah. And then, so now take that the next step. Well, if I'm trading 
two or three times a week. How good am I going to have to get at getting in and out to pay for all those costs? Sure. You see what I mean? Absolutely. But I mean, since we are talking about cost at this point, I'm just wondering, I mean, obviously cost today for trading is a lot lower than they were in the mid 90s. Um, does that change your view in, in, in some sort? Some, but it, it, not particularly. I mean, it's still, I mean, we run, we track our costs very closely. Sure. And when you add it all up and average them over, I think, 30,000 contracts we traded in X amount of years or whatever, we still see, including rolls, you know, we still see about $35 a round turn. Okay. So if I'm a CTA that does 3,000 round turns per million. Yeah. It's an expensive. 35 uh, times 3,000. Yeah. That's $105,000 a year. Yeah. That's 11%. Yeah. So the best guys in the world make 20. That's half of that. Mm. So if I just do immediately 1500 round turns, this other guy's got to beat me by five and a half percent a year just to tie me. Mm. You see what I mean? Sure. And we'll probably touch on this later, but to us, that's a, that's what we would call, that's a fact. Right. That's not an opinion, and it's not something that's based on empirical evidence. Sure. That's just a straight mathematical fact. So when we get into modeling and testing and all that, there's a huge weakness in that it's all empirically based. And I can try to make it my empirical basis as solid as possible. I can try to make it as robust as possible. But at the end of the day, the future might just be completely different than the past. Sure, true. And in which case, all of those, you know, that's the, the you know, black swan kind of idea that Tlaib put forth in his series of books, and it's a very accurate one. Mm. However, if I'm saving 5% a year in costs, that's, that's not perceptible to a black swan. Sure. In fact, it is. It can only be helped by a black. In that, that the less I trade and the wider my trading parameters are, the less impact massive gaps would have on my on my outcome. Yeah, and that the, makes sense. You see where yeah, I am there. I get that. So what I want to do is I want to line all these facts up in my favor mm. before I'm forced to use empirical evidence. Yeah, does that make sense? Sure. Sure. I mean, think about it this way. A truly losing trading strategy, by definition, has to be as rare as a truly winning one. Right. Right? Right. Because, well, I could just take the opposite of the trade. Sure. If you had a truly negative losing expectancy, that is very valuable because I could just take the opposite of your trades and I'd make money. Yeah. So those have to be very rare, correct? Sure. Or as rare as a winner, which means that most trading is random. People think that factor ABC says something about the future of price movement, but that factor is either fairly valued in the current price or does not have any impact. And it's no different than my drawing a trade out of a hat. But just because I draw a trade out of a hat, that doesn't mean that trade's going to be a loser. Sure. It's just a random trade. So most people are trading randomly with an expected loss of cost. Mm. I mean, almost by definition, that almost cannot not be true. Sure. So I have all these people, I say, okay, well, you know, Janet Yeltsin is going to say this thing about whatever interest rate, and okay, if that happens, the dollar is going to do why. Yep. And, and when they go through it, it might sound very smart, and I don't doubt they're well-educated, and it, it might be a well-thought-out opinion, but, but by definition, that is either n not predictive of the future market move, or it's already been fairly valued by the market. Mm. Because most trades that people put on have to be random. They're sure. not losing. They're ran You see what I mean? Sure. Sure, sure. I mean, I was a market maker, and I would stand in my pit, and I'd look around, and maybe not including myself, but I'd think, you know, because a lot of guys made a lot of money, and I'd be like, you know, there are 100 guys in here, and the average 
take home after their own costs of paying commissions and paying clerks and renting the seats and all that is maybe half a million dollars. So that's $50 million a year that this pit makes. Mm. Well, who pays that? Sure. It's the people who want to take positions. Yeah. Right? Definitely. So when we look at that and we think about costs, we think about this is exactly the amount of non-random price behavior I have to capture to break even and then go on to be profitable. And the lower that cost is, the less of anomaly I have to capture, and even more importantly, the more room I have for the future to be worse than the past. Sure. Nobody ever started trading a model that didn't make money in the past, right? <laughs> that's that's, <true>. that's happened never. <laughs> no investor has ever allocated money to a trader that didn't have a winning track record. <laughs> that is very true. But we don't know if those things were luck sure. or skill. And so what I'm saying is, is when, when we test something – and it made X percent over whatever, and we do our things to try to make sure that's as, as, as robust as possible. We have to be – if the future is the same as the past, we don't have a worry in the world. Yeah. And if it's better than the past, well, we definitely don't have a worry <laughs> in the world. Yeah. But what we need to worry about is what if it's still an anomaly? It's still a, a capturable, persistent, non-random price movement. Hmm. Whether it's the mispricing of a, of a corn crop yield or the mispricing of a, of a more quantitative measure, or whatever my inputs are, what if that anomaly exists in the future but less than what we've seen in the past? Yeah. Can I still make money? Sure. So, and, and was this something, a f- sort of philosophy that you shared with your partner in the time? And how did you actually meet uh, with your business partner uh, back in the day? Well, it's the, the first time I went through the model, you know, I, I think I tested it on, on a shorter time frame. And, and I, you know, I think I, you know, I used $75 or $100 a round turn contract as a, as a slippage cost estimate. Sure. And I remember that the returns came out okay, and I looked at it, but I was like, wow, I, I paid you know, $200,000 a year in costs. Mm. If I just went to a longer time frame, let's say I went to four times as long, it's pretty reasonable to assume that 80% of that would flow immediately into the profit column. Right. Right now, yeah. I'm gonna. I mean, there's some things I'm gonna have to give up. Nothing's free. I'm gonna give sure. up in, some other stuff. But, but wow, that's a. I'd like to see it like that. Yeah. And so at the time, that was the thing that I recalled most specifically that led me towards the to the longer and longer trading sure. time frame. Sure. And so it, I, I had put together a trading model. I back tested it. There was a. Another broker at our firm that was that was using it to trade a little bit in some client accounts, and I had a, I mean, I guess in retrospect I was, I was insane, but at the <laughs> time I thought I had a decent chance that I had some that would work. Right. And so I was out now looking to start my own business. So I needed two things. I needed some client capital, some people to actually believe me and trade this cockamamie scheme right and i needed some operational capital i needed a business partner to help me run the business side and, and allow me to to you know leave my current position and start this new business you know we just like any other business we needed we needed original capital and and just out of curiosity you know we're in 1999 what what were you thinking in terms of how much money do I need in terms of trading capital to start a business? What was your what was your recollection of that? Well, I had made out a pretty detailed business plan and I'd also made out a pretty detailed and I think relatively conservative what I basically took as a business proposal was that whoever would partner with this would have half the company and they would put up I think it was ninety thousand dollars, right? And then I moved into a, the 
smallest apartment in Nashville and cut my living expenses at next to nothing. Yeah. And basically with that 90, you know, it didn't take much to, to run a startup CTA. I mean, basically NFA fees and some quotes and, and that was it. Yeah. And so then I was going to make, you know, like 30,000 a year. And then if we didn't make any incentive fees, I would dial that my you know, we we had contingency plans for how we would dial back our costs, but the general idea was that we would make that ninety thousand dollars last for five years. Okay, and how much okay. trading capital were you looking to start with in your plan? Well, we were hopeful. We started with three two hundred fifty thousand dollar accounts. Wow! And that was roughly what we. I mean, I guess we were hoping maybe we would get one or two more, but I, that's more or less what we thought we would start with. And those original accounts traded at zero and 20. Yeah. And it's quite, it's not that I, do, I want to stop you in your story because I do actually want, uh, you know, that story, but I just want for people who are listening to this to realize that we're now 15 years later. And if you read the press today, they talk about that you can't start a hedge fund if it's less than one, two, three hundred million dollars in size and you started a business with three two hundred and fifty thousand dollar account and ninety thousand mm -hmm. in working capital that's extraordinary well, as i said it was insane but thank sure, you sure but well, no but but that's <laughs> no no but that's how entrepreneurship works isn't it that you do things that are probably a little bit crazy yes. um, and you know um, as steve Jobs says to the crazy ones well you have to our big thing was time. Yeah. We figured that if we had a winning method, the only thing that can, can hurt us is bad luck. Mm. And, and, and that bad luck is finite. Yeah. And so if we could survive the bad luck, eventually we'd make clients money and then eventually we'd make money. Yeah. Right? If, and, it, and that works on the assumption that you've got a winning trading model. If you don't have a winning trading model, you're done for anyway. So it's all a moot point. So our thing was the tragedy would be if we had a winning trading model, ran into bad luck early, and had to quit. Yeah, which we almost did. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to come back to that one because that's a really interesting uh, story in itself. So you and and Brint start off in in uh, 1999, uh, and and I both of you sort of sort of with a financial background, or, or how how is the uh, how, how, how did you get into it in the first place? You know, my background, I'd worked for the investment bank, and, and so I had two okay. or four or five years experience. You know, we, I worked in the futures department, and, okay. and so I, I had that. Brent's, his background was a lot in healthcare. He did a lot of healthcare. I mean, later he did a lot of healthcare building acquisition. So he had the that type of analysis in his background. He was really someone that we'd met through a friend of ours that was an accountant and we got into discussing investments and and Brince is the one person that somehow found a way in the mid to late 90s not to make money trading stocks okay Interesting. and you know he kept he would be like a very typical person somebody would have this great and you know conman and those guys have gone on to prove you know there's a narrative bias when we right. hear a great story we tend to believe the and the outcome of that story um, more than if there is not a narrative story with it. So he would have somebody come up and, oh, there's this company and they tell him this great story and it does all this and that. And Brent's would go invest in it and then it would lose money and, 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 you know, he'd lose money on it. Mm. And again, there's no, there's no plan to it. There's no structure. Where are we getting out of this trade if we get in? Why? How many con or how many shares are we going to buy? You know, there's no risk parameter. You know, but I think that's a typical person's initial foray into any markets. Mm. And as we talked about it, he said, "You know, I am so tired of chasing my tail on these stories. Mm. I've lost way more money than I should have. The market's gone vertical, and I've still lost money." And and he was very attracted to the to the systematic, process oriented, repeatable, very boring nature of what we did, right. or what I was proposing we would do. Right. I mean, more or less, we like to look at putting on trades like 
almost like here comes a refrigerator put in the shelf here comes a refrigerator put in the shelf like it's a you know a lot of times in interviews like this people say like well tell me about one of your most devastating losses <laughs> and there is a sure. i mean it's not that i like having losing trades but every loser looks the same yeah and and the worst you know losing two weeks I ever had, well, those were the ends of my best winning trades. Yes. So it's course. hard for me to say that that was a devastating, you hmm. know, that I'm, uh, cause I net made a lot of money on them. Yeah. But you know, I, I guess we have more outlier large winners that might be more of an interesting, you know, barroom chat about a trade, but, but we really don't have that kind of narrative that it, it doesn't fit well to our trading style. Yeah. So nonetheless, Prince would be would be chasing around doing that, and, and he was very attracted to the to the methodical nature of what I was proposing. Okay. So we formed the CTA. We went out. We got three accounts, and we started trading. Yeah. In September of ninety nine, mm. but uh, but Prince kept his job, and I was the only one that took any pay from Covenant Capital. So the first four or five months, we made a little bit of money. We got some small incentive fees. 2000, we, we more or less broke even. And then in 2001, I think we ended the year down about 20%. And for the, you know, for the people who, for those listeners that might do trading, you can imagine that was, that was a scary period. Because here we are. You know, we lost one of the three accounts. We're down 20%. And, you know, the big question is, is does this model work? Absolutely. I mean, th this is, you know, something that I certainly wanted to, to uh, talk to you about because I think that the psychology, you know, what keeps you in early 2002 with a tough start, to say the least, what makes you believe that this is still something you should pursue? I mean, can you remember what 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 went through your mind, so to speak, at the time? I, I can I can distinctly. Okay. At that point, there are only one of three things has occurred. Either the model worked in the past, and the whole nature of whatever the model used in the past to profit completely changed at the beginning or, you know, whenever the drawdown started, May of 2001. Right. Now, that's possible, but that seems pretty unlikely to me. Yeah. That, you know, we've tested all these different markets. We use two parameters. We use the same parameters on every market. All these things in robustness, we've tested them over decades, and the the anomaly that we're capturing disappeared May 31st, 2001. <laughs> it could happen. I, sure. I'm not eliminating, but that seems far-fetched. Yeah. The second possibility, and the one we needed to protect against is, somehow in our modeling and testing, we lied to ourselves. Yeah. We curve fit some things. We'd done all this by hand. So had I made mistakes and, and falsified this? And then the other possibility is we just ran into some bad luck. Yeah. Because like anything else, there's going to be some distribution of returns in the thing we're doing. And if we're operating even one deviation to the bad, that's going to be losing. Mm. Right? Sure. So been really, there's no other possible outcome. Those are only three things, and I felt relatively comfortable eliminating the first. Right. So basically, we went back, and each individually, and it took hundreds of hours. Yeah. But of course, what else am I doing? I don't. It, the, <laughs> we don't trade very frequently, and there's sure. certainly no marketing <laughs> I'm going to do. So sure. I've got a lot of time on my hands. So we, I went back, and Brince went back, and we both by hand redid redid the entire back test. Wow. And both of them came out, you know, equal to what we'd done and originally in back testing, and we felt like that pretty safely eliminated number two. Mm. Which means that in reality, there's probably an eighty to ninety percent probability, if not higher, that we're just in number three. Yeah. It has to have been bad luck. Mm. 
there's a chance, but I'd probably put it at 85 to 95 percent chance that that it had just been bad luck. And so in our business plan, we had written out some things like in case of emergency, break glass. And we actually had to break the glass. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and you're like, wow, when I wrote this out, I sure didn't think we'd be doing this. No. Nope. Here's what we do. And basically what we do gets back to that time aspect and that if, you know, at the time the model was so low maintenance that, I mean, we only had two accounts. Yeah. And we made maybe 30 trades a year. Right. It, it, it really did not take full time. You know, we left stops in with the brokers. It didn't take a full time employee. So when I needed to find an alternate source of income, so I didn't have to take money from Covenant Capital. Sure. So at the time, I moved to Chicago. I took a job making markets down at the CBOE, the options exchange. Okay. And Brince and I, between, you know, handled the trading duties uh, between us for the next. I guess that was 2002 through 2004. Okay. And that, you know, basically at that time, I mean, we were only spending a couple thousand dollars a year. So that really perpetuated uh, the existence of Covenant Capital and gave the method a, a, a long enough time frame that we could, it would be unlikely that bad luck could persist that long. Yeah, absolutely. Also within that, when we went back through and did that research again, we we did come across a couple of fairly critical insights that we with which we evolved the model. And so not only did the market conditions improve for us, but but the model also, I would say maybe rather dramatically improved with those changes. Yeah. And you know, from that point on we really have had some pretty pretty good returns. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's 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 very interesting uh, to 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 see back and 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 actually from from the time where it looked the darkest, uh, you know, probably three or four straight exceptionally profitable years came along, and, uh, mm-hmm. and as you said, you know, the rest is history. But I think it's an important story to share because most people may not realize that you know uh, no business in well certainly businesses in general, but also businesses in our industry it's not a straight line it's it's a fight and if you have the passion and and you know you sometimes have to grind it out and and that's what you did and and you know certainly the success has come back so bringing us up to date uh you run three programs tell us tell me a little bit about where they stand from a, an asset on the management point of view i guess we really have four programs okay. one of them is is what we would call a custom program so one of the things we do is for clients that are large, you know, north of 25 or $50 million to invest. If they want to take our trading model and customize it to their needs, uh, we will do so for that level of investment. So okay. the, the, what we've done is, is there's a large institutional client and what they basically want us to do is trade our model long only and commodities only. Right. Okay. So we basically take our return stream, we peel out all shorts and we peel out financial markets. So, um, since it's customizable, it's not investable by anybody, you know, but so, but we have about a hundred million in that program. Okay. We've got our aggressive and our original and our optimal. Okay. All three of those take the exact same trading signals. It's all, the only difference between them is a, is the position sizing. Yeah. Uh, original being the least aggressive, optimal being the most aggressive. And we've got about oh, 150 to 175 million spread across those two. Most of it is in the original aggressive, or probably 60 and 90 million each. And optimals, I want to say five. Sure, sure. Fantastic. Great, great, great story. Thank you for sharing that, Scott. That's really uh, impressive. Now, well, I want to ask you one thing uh, before we leave the time frame uh, point of view, and maybe we'll come back to it later. Um, but I just want to ask you one thing, and that is, it looks to me that uh, more and well, on one side, we have for sure in the last 10 years seen a number of short term traders come and uh, some have gone, but there are a few that have been become very successful, lots of money under management and doing well. 
But it seems to me also that at the same time, a lot of the established managers have actually, in fact, become longer term themselves. And I just wanted to ask you in general, is there a risk somewhere, do you think, in more and more people becoming long ter- longer term uh, in the sense that when things do change one day and trends, you know, may change direction, that more and more people and, and, and most likely the, the larger managers, so to speak, um, have to run for the exit at the same time? I'm not a big conspiracy theorist, meaning that I don't spend a lot of time out looking for that kind of boogeyman. Uh, if that were the case, we would see a dramatic increase in our slippage. Right. Right. I mean, that that's what we're really saying is I, I think I'm going to get out at 122.09, but because all these giant managers are getting out at the same time, I'm really getting out at, at 121.09. Right. Then another thing might be is that had these managers all not needed to get out, the market would have maybe only declined to 123, but because all these other guys had to get out, it pushed the market down into my stop at 122.09, and so perhaps I would have stayed in that trade some amount or whatever. Mm. So the two things that we would see, if that were the case, I mean, the first one would be uh, you would see a dramatic increase in slippage, Yeah. right? I mean, that, that's your primary fear in that regard. And then you'd see some kind of either decrease in winning percentage or, or truncation in my average winner, meaning that these trends wouldn't go on as long because on small reversals, they would turn into big reversals and I'd, I'd be forced to get out. Mm. So that, those, are, those are not things that we've seen. Okay, okay. So, you know, I think that Pretty much, you know, there's always going to be a flavor of the of the three year period. Yeah, whatever happens to have done well in the last three years, you're going to see more of those kind of people because they're the ones that have made some money, and they're probably the ones that have attracted more money. Mm. And the aspiring new traders, that's the that's the world they're going to have seen. You know, and people people tend towards shorter term. Mm. I probably have five or six. New traders a year will call me and say, hey, you've had some whatever level of success. Would you mind talking to me about this and the business and whatever? I've never had one of those people not be a short-term trader. Right. So you've got to assume that you know, almost all of them are going to fail yeah. just by definition. Yeah. I mean, you see what I mean? So it's never – no one ever comes to me and says, hey, I got a long-term model. <laughs> it's always – intraday, intra-week at the longest. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, I, do, I, I do see evidence of that as well happening, but I also see evidence of people who, you know, have been successful in the past and probably people who've been around for a while, I would say, um, and who have actually done reasonably well in the last few years where it's been difficult and where they tend to become longer term. But what I wanted to ask you as well as sort of the final point before we move on to the next section is really as managers in some ways and arguably for good reasons uh, that you've shared today should be longer term, investors seem to be going the other way. Investors seem to me to be coming shorter term and not actually allowing their managers much time to, uh, you know, go through a full cycle. Is there anything we can do to persuade investors to see it the way you see it and and uh, explaining how important it is to have a long-term horizon? Well, now, when I say long-term, I mean the holding period of a given trade. Yeah. And, and not necessarily a, a given allocation. True. Okay. But to answer your question, yep. no, there isn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is not... And the reason that investors are looking for short term is that short term has done a little bit better in the last three or four years, right? I mean, I mean, you've been around long enough. Sure, you're, sure. You're, I mean, it's it's almost like it's coded in our DNA. They're almost always going to be chasing whatever happened to have been hot in the last, you know, eighteen to thirty six months. Yeah, sounds about right. Right. I mean, when did people start talking about loving the stock market again? Yeah. 
12 because it had done well in 9, 10, and 11. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think if you look at mutual fund inflows, or I mean, certainly if you looked at our inflows, it's almost laughable. Yeah. That I can promise you in February of 2002, which would have been the best moment to have ever invested <laughs> with us. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we were years away from getting a phone call. Yeah. I mean, never. And then we brought tons of money in in 06, yeah. right before we had a two-year flat period. And then we brought a lot of money in in 2010, right yeah. before we had a couple-year flat. You know, I mean, maybe sure. we'll catch the tail end. but sure. but. Yeah, no, this is very, uh, very classical. Regardless of, the, regardless of the, of the, alleged sophistication <laughs> i have yet i mean it's very rare i mean i mean there's some some times a little bit but at the end of the day regardless of the alleged sophistication allocators and investors are chasing 24 month returns yeah now i want to move on to a slightly different topic uh, um which is um, sort of more about how you've um designed your organization just from a broad point of view but i want to bring up something that i that caught my eye and that is you make a point about labeling different types of managers such as boutiques you have battleships you have emerging and experimental managers why do you do that and what's the important thing that people need to understand in this regard well we try to look at whether it's CTAs or hedge funds, we kind of break down the whole landscape into those four categories. Yeah. And talking about CTAs, you know, we think that there are two somewhat critical lines of demarcation. And and while where we draw the line is is certainly, you know, like we look at a ten year track record. Now, does that mean an eight-year track record's no good? No, obviously we pick ten because it's rounder. But <laughs> but the idea is that a is that one of the few things that actually can can predict just sustainability of a hedge fund is the fact that it's lasted longer. Right. I think if you read uh, Anti Fragile, another Tlaib book, he talks about a te- you know the the best way to estimate how long a technology will exist is how long it has existed. Okay. And so, and then and again, they, they, there shows that there's a certain robustness there. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, our industry is, is fraught with overestimation of the usefulness of statistical techniques. Mm. And, and, you know, mo, you know, if you look at a top returner, Probably they are overperforming their expected future return. Right, and that would be a whole other discussion. But regardless, we think length of track record is very important. Yeah. And then the second thing that we draw a line in is uh, amount of money under management. Yeah. And so when we look at what we would call the battleships, those are going to be in for CTA terms. Let's say north of seven hundred and fifty or to a billion dollars. Okay. They're going to be giant group. And longer than a ten-year track record. Mm. So these are the biggest established, well-known names. They're obviously pretty good at trading, or they wouldn't have lasted that long and gotten that much money. Mm. Their limitations are going to be is that the liquidity of the various markets is going to going to limit them to primarily financials. Right. And that that's just a you know you just can't do a fifteen thousand lot in cocoa. No. And so, you know, they're going to have some commodity exposure. Their commodity exposure is probably going to come in groups. So, so all the grains together are about the equivalent of a, of a full market size, all the energies, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And so then from there, we move into over a billion but under a 10-year track record. Right. And we call those experimental. And to me, those are the most – I find these the most interesting mm-hmm. is that – You've got a four or five year track record and two billion dollars. <laughs> sure. To me, that's a, you know, we call it experimental for a reason. That's a pretty big experiment because yeah. you haven't proved, and, and not the ten years proves anything, but you definitely haven't proved much, mm. and yet you have a lot of money to manage. Yeah. 
So, you know, the other problem with your larger managers is you start seeing returns get dumbed down. And, and, and you know what? That's what most of their clients want anyway. But, you know, just do the math. If you're managing a billion dollars and you're getting a 1% management fee, that's a lot of money. Sure. Uh, all I need to do now is not lose that money. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and, you know, so, and, and again, for some and even maybe many clients, that's what they're looking for. But the experimental with the shorter track record and a lot of money, you're talking about a lot of growth in infrastructure, a lot of growth in, you know, and having to handle that in a short amount of time with a method that certainly probably hasn't made it through two different market environments. Yeah. If I could use that phrase. Yeah. So the next thing we would look at is the emerging manager. And, and that's your typical under 10 year track record, you know, under 500 million, probably under. $10 million in management. Mm. And where we are and what we think is, a, I mean, obviously we <laughs> think it's attractive because that's us, sure. is that we, we're a boutique. Yeah, We are not attempting to be the fidelity of CTAs or the TD Ameritrade or whatever the biggest, you know, we want to manage a stable amount of money to keep the business stable, but not so much that it's going to impede the, our ability to have exposure to a wide variety of markets. Yeah. We have over a 10 year track record. Sure. We have uh, appropriate infrastructure. We have traded through multiple presidents and economic cycles and and world events and and you know unpredictable world events and and we've at least shown the ability to to stay alive throughout that process yeah our lower levels of assets under management allow us to have exposure long and short to you know multiple different markets that while other groups while the larger groups might trade them they really can't have any impact on their outcome mm. And so, you know, and with that, you know, we'll do things like customize a portfolio if that's what you want. Mm. And, and so with that, we think, you know, we look at ourselves like a, a, a watchmaker, you know, F.B. Jorn. <laughs> they make 400 watches a year. They don't make as many watches as Timex. Sure. But those watches get a lot of attention. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we look at ourselves in that same vein. Okay. And we think we can kind of bring the best of both worlds. Sure. We've we've got a – it's not overdone, but we have a reasonable infrastructure. We've got a long trading history. We have got the protections in place to make an institution feel safe. Mm. But we also have the, the – we're not encumbered by our size. Mm. And we are also still interested in return rather than than just – milking a man a perpetual management fee sure absolutely how many people are you by the way i don't even we have know. seven okay prince and i and then five employees sure sure now track record we've touched a little bit upon the track record but what i'd love to do is to ask you how one should read your track record because we all know that strategies evolve over time and therefore in a sense one could say that actually a track record sure it shows that you've survived it shows that you have had some uh, innovation but i think sometimes people get uh, maybe a little bit um, fooled to believe that a track record is a great indication of what the future is going to look like because they don't really know what changes have happened along the way in the model so in some ways, one could say that maybe it's better to look at a backtest of the current model when you look at a manager. Maybe that would say more about you know the future. I don't know. But I'd love to yeah. hear about what your view and what your uh, observation is about your own track record because you mentioned uh, the short side of things. And I know there was a period where I think you didn't take any short trades uh, at all. Um, so I'd like to have, I mean, I'd, like, I'd love to hear your your philosophical view about short trades, because I don't think many people realize that there is a big difference between the long side and the short side in terms of success and profitability. Um, but um, also generally maybe putting that into context about your own uh, 
your own uh, track record and, and, and why you made the changes along the way? Well, I think you make an excellent point about track records. I think people look at them as some kind of like a one loss record in a sporting event and they, they miss the enormous amounts of variance and randomness that happen to have lined up and occurred to produce whatever monthly return is shown or sure. daily return. Sure. Um, I think that most groups don't do enough qualitative analysis of the trading method. Right. And simply crunch performance numbers as though they're the end all be all yeah. of what the future is going to be. Yeah. Uh, you make an interesting point. I would probably argue that a back test of the current running model is probably the best, except that it is also going to go on, you know, if you're hoping to be a five or 10 year investor, mm. there are going to be future changes. So, sure. and so what I might say is, is, as we've progressed, our changes have been successful, and therefore, perhaps one would conclude that our future changes would also be successful. Sure. But, you know, that's a different discussion. <laughs> um, our first major change to the model was in early 2002 was basically eliminating short trades and using a volatility filter for long trades was the short trades the cause of your drawdown back back in the beginning no all right no so why did you make a change to uh, eliminate short trades back in 2002 well short trades and this is particularly appropriate on our time frame mm. on a shorter time frame i don't think this this would not hold as much okay but let's imagine on our time frame we're trying to hold a good winner for let's say over a year right Okay, and a short trade is bounded. <laughs> it's certainly bounded by zero. Yeah, and in reality, in a lot of these things, it's bounded by something north of zero. Sure. Right. But I'll give you even to zero. That's fine. It. It. it the, the point is still the same. Yeah. So a short trade is going to be. It's going to face several hurdles. The first is, if you took every sell signal of silver at nine dollars and i took every buy signal of silver at nine dollars i'm going to and, and i'm looking for you know our trading system is trend following it's built around large deviation winners and outlying you know large moves all of your trades are going to be limited to making nine dollars yeah and mine aren't yeah furthermore let's imagine we we had two good trades you sold yours at nine and it Move five dollars down to four, and I bought mine at nine. It moved five dollars, and it's at fourteen. Mm -hmm. Now, how are we sitting? Because you're in terrible position. Sure, you see what I mean. I mean, yeah. you have virtually nothing that can be made. Yeah, probably a lot of risk in the position, in that you've had a large and rapid move, mm. and you're seeing an intra-trade decompounding effect. Because now a 10% move for you is only sure. 40 cents. Yeah. Well, I've had the exact opposite happen. Mm. I'm getting a compounding effect, meaning I got to enter in a volatility and even a, even a percentage move where at nine, and now I'm into 14. Right. And every dollar I go up, you know, a 10% move for me now is a dollar 40. Sure. So if you imagine that, that okay, these rare moves, however we want to define them, come along equally as infrequently. Mm. Meaning you and I both have the same chance of one of these rare moves occurring. And in your rare move, let's just for this trade example, you had to risk 50 cents in silver to make, I mean, what could you make? Six dollars? Mm. So you could have a 12 to 1 winner at best, mm. right? And that, that's riding 9 down to 3. And not only does the market get to 3, but your exit's got to get to 3. Sure. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And then, Grand, you could catch some rolls in there. I get all, but let's, let, we, I think we could both agree that'd be a huge winner short. Yeah. My buy of nine, at $9, well, silver's gone to 50 twice, <laughs> right? Yeah. So for the same 50 cent risk and equally as likely an outcome, I'm going to make 
let's say I got out at 45, 68 times my initial risk. Mm. Well, start doing the math. Yep. You make 12 times, I make 68 times. You are going to have to be, it's going to have to happen six times as often mm. for you, mm. for you to, to, to tie me. Yeah. Does that seem likely? Now, that doesn't mean in a three-year period, I mean, in 2008, you're going to murder me. Right. Right? Then, that, then this is where people, in a three-year period, shorts could, could do way better. Mm. And honestly, in a 10-year period, they could do a little better. Mm. I mean, that gets a little less likely because a lot of these markets are reciprocals of each other. Mm. Long dollar is short euro and sweat, you know, but, but – there could be a very a long term in, in time in which there was a large decline in overall prices in which shorts might, you know, they could do better. Absolutely. Mm. Now, and much better. Shorts might make 30% a year while longs lost five. Sure. But and this gets back into the qualitative and quantitative of it. Mm. Qualitatively. I don't think my point is can there's no point against me. Mm. Like logically, if we sat in a courtroom and argued it, I'm killing you on that argument. Sure. You see what I mean? And I think we both know if we both took ten thousand trades and you took all shorts and I took all longs and what <laughs> I've just described, you can't beat me. Sure. It's it's you're 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 just done for. Yeah. But that doesn't mean in a five year period that your track record might not be better than mine. No, of course. That's right. You see what I mean? And and, and that's a difficulty. But that's that's a, a good insight in, into how we try to look at research and how we try to look at trading and trading from a strategic standpoint or even a philosophical standpoint, and I'd say strategic. And and how we might attack a research problem. So what we really what we really evolved into is is that shorts and longs need to be tr- treated differently. Right. Initially, when I buy at 9 and you sell at 9, those trades are very similar. Mm. Right? For the first dollar or two move. Sure. They're very similar. It's only as they progress that yours gets worse and worse and worse while mine conversely is getting better and better and better. Mm. So now I've got I need to I need to appropriately weight the fact that my long trades are, are ultimately going to be a lot better. But I can also maybe make some adjustments to how I handle a trade intra-trade to mirror the way a trade evolves. That makes sense? Sure. And so as the years have passed, what we've attempted to do is just get better at how we trade short because there are, you know, shorts actually have over time proven to be the best diversifier versus longs. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, they're a part of the portfolio and have been for years, but, but I like to think, obviously, we wouldn't <laughs> have made the changes if we didn't think they were better, that we've gotten better at understanding how short trades work and and why they're worse than longs and how that evolves and, and then that we've then created tactics to to kind of minimize the weakness of short trades. Yeah. So has that really been the main changes over time? Has been sort of the taking out short trades and putting them back in in a different form, so to speak? It, in a big picture, what we've, what I think we've done better with over time is basically, if you took a, st- you know, we're not, we don't, we're not big into the tactics. Right. I always say, I mean, one of the first challenges we give anybody that we hire is, follow these five strategies, and and you can use any tactics you want, but you won't be able to come up with a losing model. Hmm. Does that make you see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like, basically, long term trend follow. Yeah. I don't care. There are a dozen different, you know, people get in. What? What? Are, how are you? Do- we got to draw a line in the sand somewhere that says a trend might be beginning. Mm. Then we got to have some volatility base point that says this is where I'm exiting. Yeah. I got to have some method to handle trades that win. Mm. That's it. Yeah. Right. Then I'm going to position size. I'm going to control risk through my position sizing, and. You know, in a big picture now, I mean, and we talk about writing something on the back of a napkin. 
if you looked at what went into every piece of the model and everything, it would probably look more complex. Mm. But from a big picture standpoint, those are really the only things you need to think about. Mm. And so we are not big into trying to predict where the market's going to go. We don't think we can. Right. We're not big into, oh, you know, the this, you know, we're going to use this. We don't think we have any magic pixie dust that tells me when a trend's going to start. <laughs> but I do know this. If I get a signal long and, and you some other time had the same signal at the same risk short, I know that mine is better. Mm. That I know for a fact. And you see what I mean? Sure. I'm not trying to guess, oh, well, you know, Hillary Clinton's going to get elected and that's going to do this and that. And, and people can do that. And maybe they can do it effectively. I don't know. But I can tell you for sure my long signal's better. Mm. Now, what I would argue is you're going to have to get awfully good at predicting future worldwide elections and results and all that to overcome that my long signals are way better. Mm. Because they're unbounded and they're going to compound within the trade. Sure. You see what I mean? Yeah. So what we think we've gotten better at along the way is I've got a basic trend following model and it generates signals. Right. Which of those signals are worth taking risk on and which ones aren't? Right. Without trying to predict if a trend will ensue and how far or how large a trend might ensue. Mm. That makes sense? Sure. Like I mentioned, uh, a volatility filter. Mm. If, again, I'll use silver. Let's imagine I get a long signal in silver at $9, but the recent volatility has been very high, and so through whatever metrics we use, I'd have to risk $0.90. cents. Mm. And then there's some other point in time, you get the same signal at $9, but recent volatility has been low, and you're only going to have to risk $0.45. Cents. Mm. Okay, so the first thing we know is, if we're risking the same amount of money on each trade, if I do five contracts, you're going to get to do 10. Sure. Well, let's imagine the same trend comes along. You're going to make twice as much money. Yeah. Right? And we knew that at the inset. We knew that for a fact. Sure. I'm going to need twice as large a trend to come to make the same amount of money as you. And by definition, a trend that's twice as large as, you know, if trend A is twice as large as trend B, trend A has to be more rare. Yeah. Right? So those are the kind of improvements we like to think that we've made on our model. Mm. As well as... You know, diversify. You know, there's there's some advantage to diversifying entry points, diversifying exit points, and it isn't that one is better than another. Sometimes one's going to be better, sometimes the other's going to be better. The main thing is that is that you know you want to or we try to achieve a, a robust or even a smoothing effect to that. If we dive into the model itself, so to speak, and 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 and, and trying to understand, um, I mean, my understanding is that you. In terms of the data input, actually, don't look at even, even not even daily data, as, as far as I understand. Um, you, you have a, an even longer uh, time frame. We tend to look mostly at, at weekly data. Right. So, at any given, say, end of week, so to speak, you run your 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 model, and 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 new signals uh, uh, comes along. But 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 explain to me. How many different, I assume from our conversation that you actually treat, maybe with the exception of long and short trades, but you treat generally all markets equal. So you run the same model on all markets. Would that be fair? We run the same model on all markets. Every input is the same. Okay. And how many different entry points or models, I guess is a better word for it, maybe that can generate an entry point, uh, do, you, do you actually run? Well, I suspect it would depend on how you wanted to look at it. We right. have three different potential points for an entry. Okay. But those are all, and, and then the, the filters applied to those points are the same, and each of those entry points is derived through the same method. Okay. So you could say one. To, to me, the, the, the fewer parameters, mm. I mean, if I were making allocations, one of the first things I'd ask anybody is, how many parameters do you use? Mm. 
And I, I remember one time, Brince and I were talking with a guy, and, and he said, I got 63 different models. Now, models 1, 9, 12, and 16, they work great on wheat. <laughs> and a lot of people think this, and, and, and I guess you can, and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think so. Is, and I said, really, those work on wheat, but they don't work on corn or the S&P. Mm. No. S&P now, 2, 4, 9. Now, 16 works pretty good there, but it doesn't work good on bond. You know, sure. To me, that's the ultimate height of curve fitting. Yeah. If you're going to allow me 63 different models, each one that has eight different parameters, and I get to – well, yeah, I'm going to win You know, in the back history an unlimited amount I mean, of money. But to think that that's going to work going forward is questionable at best, I would say. Mm. And so we're, you know, robustness is is a, is probably the cornerstone of anything we would do in research. Mm. I would put it this way: whatever we might discover is probably has probably performed better than its future expectation. Right. I mean, let's imagine that there are nine different trading strategies that that one could use to make money in the future. And they're all going to have huge variance with how they've done in whatever recent, you know, when, whenever you find something out of an unlimited group like potential trading strategies, and the one you find has, quote unquote, done the best over a given period, it is almost by definition, it has to have been outperforming its expected future return, mm. right? It's like when guys look at managers and they say, okay, here's the top 10% out of 500, mm over three years. Well, those guys are going to be the ones who the markets happen to have fit what their strategy is the best. Mm. And they're also going to be the ones probably that took the most biggest risks on those. I just bought a lot of Apple and it went way up. <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, sure. you see, and the same with us. Sure. If it happened to have been a, you know, a 2000, Two and three and four, a perfect yeah. example. Yeah. That was perfect for us. Yeah. Low volatility, market screaming upwards. I don't think we necessarily took the most risk. But if we'd taken more risk, we would have mm. had higher returns. Yeah. And that return set, our expected return isn't 50% a year. Sure. What is it? Well, it depends on which, you know, which <laughs> program you look at. If we look at just the original program, what, what, what would you be saying to people saying, what, what should I expect? Oh, I think after fees, it's pretty reasonable. Expect, I mean, I would, I am a big under, try to overperform. <laughs> I think it's reasonable to expect fifteen percent. Yeah, and I think if you expected only fifteen, it's unlikely that you would be disappointed, and you're probably gonna, you know, I think there's a decent chance we'll do better than that. But again, this is over a decade. Yeah, and you know, this is going to be over a decade. Yeah, and. And with you putting X amount of money in and not increasing and decrease, you know, sure, you know, if, if if you said to me, "Hey, Scott, you know, I really like what you said today," I think you put that in there. I think fifteen percent is a very reasonable amount, and you know, the way we do our risk now is that we can everything's based on containing the largest drawdown. So I could do that with a virtually guaranteed less than 25% drawdown. So Which is pretty good. I, I think it's very acceptable. It, you know, uh, and that isn't it, you know, people can do better than that. Great. Have at it. I, I, you know, but I think we'll find enough clients for that. Sure. sure now sure. it would be, I would advise something else. I would say you should invest less money in the optimal program. Mm. That is a far smarter thing to do. But, that's a whole different soapbox. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Now, so you have three ways of generating signals. Um, and to me, that would suggest that you build your position in, in, in three stages, although maybe in theory it could all happen in one day. Um, but, but that's uh, how, how I understand it. You're going to, yeah. I mean, if, if you, you're going to get in and then if it rallies a little bit more, you're going to sure. get in some more sure. if you're going long. And then the same with going short. What I would I would probably say we get our you know we, we put our positions on one way but but we have three different points of doing so but that's yeah. some 
statistics. Just out of curiosity, uh, and I obviously don't know if this applies uh, to you, but but I su- su- suspect it does, and, and that is you're either using moving averages or using price breakout channels. Curious to know which one you've gone with, but also why. I would one-up you with that and say that doesn't matter. Okay. You could give me... I mean, we've chosen something because we had to choose it. Yeah. But... And and actually, in our research, we we also use a lot of what we we've created three different what we call dummy systems, mm-hmm. so that when I if I want to test the theory, for instance, the efficacy of short trades, not only do we run it on our model, but we run it on each of the dummy models. Because mm. if short trades are worse in our model, they really ought to be worse in the other ones too, <laughs> right? Sure. I mean that the the changing of models should not change that philosophy. Yeah. But. I can promise you that whether we used channels, moving averages crossing, percentage moves, uh, linear regressions, standard deviations, we've looked at all those things and, and many more, none of those things make any difference. Okay. In fact, that's probably the biggest, I think the biggest misconception is, is that or whether we'd gone out and, and created our own in-house proprietary indicators. Mm. The efficacy of a trade... Now, the time frame is important. Yes. Very important. But if you said, hey, Scott, I want you to use whatever your favorite thing was, I could create something that's future expected return would be the same as ours. Mm. You could tell me whichever one you wanted. Okay. Interesting, and, and that's not to make me sound grand, by the way. Of, of <laughs> I, I would, I would virtually, virtually any, I think, is experienced, well established, you know, CTA could. We talk about time frame as maybe being something that has influenced returns in the last few years, and and we talk about you know whether short term traders have done better than longer term, and and in some instances we've certainly seen the example of longer term traders done better than short term. But actually, I want to throw in one more thing in this uh, discussion, and that is sector allocation. Because in my mind, actually, I think one could argue that sector allocation, either by design or by default, have made a huge impact in recent years. And you could say that because large managers by default have had to be more focused on bonds and equities, they perhaps have made money more by luck than by skill. Or is that too harsh? Well, their outperformance in a, in a- short time frame any outperformance in a short time frame is 100% luck right and so yeah i mean if if you were comparing us to a 10 billion dollar manager that in, in a 3 year period even a 5 year period mm. it's pretty much going to be how did bonds and currencies trend versus commodities mm. That's going to be a whole deciding factor in three years. And then again, this is why now in 10 years, the idea would be is that those things will have started to cancel each other out. Mm. Cotton and coffee did awesome this year. And then the euro currency did awesome this next year. And then those start to cancel out. And then the, the real strategical differences between the two start to show up. Mm. Right. But I mean, if you look at it scientifically, the fact is, is that the, if I have a certain trading edge, the more times I can apply that edge, the better. Yeah. And so on a future expected basis, trading more markets is without question more desirable than trading fewer. Mm. Although, just as you said, in, and, and that's again why – the investment horizon of an allocator can be and, – and how they look at things can be so misleading. If I only traded stock indexes, I would have crushed it the last couple of years. Sure. But that would be a foolish way to trade because yeah. then I'm saying, oh, well, stock indexes adhere to this anomaly I think I have, not other markets. <laughs> hmm. Or if other markets do adhere to it, but I don't trade them, well, well, why wouldn't I want to get – that would be like the Bellagio closing down all its blackjack tables except <laughs> for the one that had done the best in the last hour. Sure. Right? I mean, that, that, that's 
foolhardy. Yeah. So trading more markets is a huge advantage, mm. assuming that they're diversified enough that they're, you know, but trading more markets is an advantage. Having, and it's only advantage in that I get more instances in a time frame. Mm. Now, in a given year, you may, or three years or five years, yes, some sector, I mean, let's talk, if we're talking trend following or what, you know, whatever it is, some sector is going to, is by definition, something has to have done the best. Yeah. So, yeah. And so, and this gets back to my earlier point, when you then go sort the managers by, by their three-year track record, who's going to be at the top? Sure. Whoever happens to specialize in that sector. Mm. Or does that mean they're more likely to make money in the future? Nope. Well, I mean, maybe, but if, I mean, if that's going to be, if that is where you want to make your stand, then have at it. Mm. But it's pretty questionable. But it's interesting. I mean, I find it fascinating the way you talk about time frame and you talk about these long term time frames. And um, yeah, I, 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 I can imagine it's not easy to get investors to to share that horizon so to speak because if you want to take not easy out and replace it with impossible yeah. that you'd be correct yeah but that's the business that i've chosen sure i i mean i know full and well that the next time we get hot mm. for 24 months yeah. will attract a lot of money mm. that's a fact yeah and the next will keep attracting money as long as we quote unquote stay hot. Mm. And then the next time we have a, you know, a drawdown, which will come, that's guaranteed, mm. and it'll last for X amount of period, we'll lose a mm. third of the money that we had. Yeah. That's just the fact of the matter. I mean, we attempt, we try, we talk about these things with our clients, but, but it is probable that the Homo sapien is not particularly hardwired very well for trading. Why did you choose such a difficult path, Scott? <laughs> no one's ever called me a smart person. <laughs> uh, they're obviously huge advantage. I mean, the the industry is extremely high paying. Yeah, I like the. I've always been inter you know interested in. I remember when I was like 10 or 11 years old, my mom tells a story that I was homesick from school and I told her to go to the library and bring home every book on gambling she could find. Okay. And I distinctly remember being like 11 or 12 and sitting with a notebook and, and a book open trying to find some system to beat a roulette wheel. Mm -hmm. So I've always been attracted and had a, a decent <laughs> Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.